Hello, Community Bible Church. We're so excited to be worshiping with you uh, today. We're going to start our service by just reminding ourselves of the great mercy of our God by singing His Mercy is More. Let's sing this together. encouraging is it that although our sins may be many, his mercy is more. I want to read from Romans 8, starting in verse 14. It says, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may be glorified with him. The song Standing in the Victory we introduced on Easter, and it's gonna, it goes so well with not only that passage, but what we're talking about this morning, because we're talking about anxiety, and we're talking about um, different ways to think about it biblically and how to combat anxiety when it arises in our lives. So I invite you to sing this with us. I will not be anxious. Jesus, you are near. Peace of God surrounding me. 
casting out all fear. The hand that holds the heavens is the mighty hand that saves. The voice that calms the storming sea is calling me by name. I'm sending in the victory, the victory of the cross, resting in the shadow of your redeeming love. I'm standing on the promise, the promise of new life, because I am yours forever, and Jesus, you are mine. Oh, Jesus, you are mine.
we pray in those times when we do feel anxious, when we do, when we are afraid, that we will remember the words of these songs, that we can, that we are standing in the victory of the cross and that nothing can take your love away from us. And God, we pray in those times that we would cry out to you and not try and solve it on our own, but we would cry out, Lord, we need you because you're the only one who can give us comfort and peace in those times of anxiety and stress. So God, we thank you for the encouragement that these songs are. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, Community Bible Church. I hope that you all are doing well. I hope that you're staying healthy. And I can say from the bottom of my heart that I really <laughs> miss seeing you guys. I, I cannot wait until I can stand on this stage and, and look out and just see everybody face to face. And I'm sure many of you are feeling that way, not just about me, but about each other. We miss gathering together as a church family. But uh, until then, until we can gather together again, we're going to keep moving forward and just do the best we can during this difficult time. Well, for anybody watching this video who does not know me, my name is Seth Gein, and I'm the Associate Pastor of Discipleship here at CBC. And this particular week, is a bit of an in-between week as far as the preaching schedule goes. So a little while ago, we finished up our sermon series on Ecclesiastes. That brought us up to Easter. Last week, the week following Easter, Pastor Chuck did a great job teaching about the road to Emmaus in Luke 24. Next week, you're going to get to hear from Pastor Jeremy Wissink for a Youth Sunday. And this week just falls in between all of that which means Community Bible Church, which means that it is a great opportunity to do a one-week standalone sermon. So as I was coming up to this time, I was thinking and praying and asking myself this question. What biblical topic would be most beneficial to the church body right now? 
especially considering all the ramifications and craziness going on with COVID-19, is there a specific biblical topic that is going to be of help to us in this situation? And the answer that came back as I thought about it was this. We need to be talking about anxiety. Anxiety is something that a lot of us are facing and, and know that I include myself in that as well. I mean, more than once over the last month, I have caught myself feeling worried and anxious because of all the uncertainty going on right now. In fact, it turns out for a lot of Americans, anxiety due to the coronavirus pandemic has become overwhelming, even to the point of being debilitating. I found an article, caught my eye. It was posted just a little while ago from marketwatch.com. And the title of the article is this. It says, anti-anxiety medication prescriptions have spiked 34% during the coronavirus pandemic. I'll read just a few highlights from the article. It says the coronavirus is taking its toll on mental health. The number of prescriptions for antidepressant, anti-anxiety, and anti-insomnia medications filled per week has increased. Anti-anxiety drugs, however, saw the biggest spike, jumping 34.1%, which was more than double, double the number of insomnia aids and almost twice as high as antidepressants. This analysis shows that many Americans are turning to medications for relief and demonstrates the serious impact that COVID-19 may be having on our nation's mental health. So let's, let's talk about anxiety. We're going to take a look at what the Bible has to say about it. And this particular sermon, I should tell you ahead of time, is going to be intensely practical. And the reason it's going to be intensely practical is because the Bible itself is intensely practical particularly when talking about anxiety, you know, fortunately for us, the Bible doesn't just say, hey, don't be anxious. And if you are being anxious or you're feeling anxious, then stop it. The Bible doesn't say that. It tells us to not be anxious, but then it goes even further by giving a way for us to overcome anxiety, to counteract anxiety so we don't allow it to just continually fill our minds. So we're going to talk about that in the latter half of this sermon. For now, let's begin by just going to scripture and seeing which what it's, and seeing some of the main biblical passage passages that address anxiety. So, grab your Bible and turn with me to Philippians chapter 4. I'll get over there myself. Okay. Philippians chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 4. Paul says this, and if you're familiar with the book of Philippians, it's all about being joyful and rejoicing, even in the midst of hard circumstances. And Paul opens up chapter 4, verse 4, by reminding his readers of this again. So Paul writes this. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So Paul opens up by saying, rejoice in the Lord. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. And then he says, do not be anxious about anything. So I want to dive in even on that specific word that's being translated anxious or maybe in your translation worry. What precisely is Paul as well as other New Testament writers referring to when they use that word? Well, the word being translated anxiety is used multiple times in the New Testament. It's a, an interesting Greek word. The pronunciation of it is merimnao, and it has a couple of subtly different meanings. 
there are two senses in which merimnao can be used. Now, the first sense is this. It can mean to be concerned or to care about something. And as you might be able to tell, even from me saying it, that's not necessarily a negative thing. It can, in fact, be a really positive thing. A perfect example of this is found just a little earlier in Philippians chapter 2, verse 20, where Paul, talking to the church at Philippi, says this. He says, For I have no one like him, referring to Timothy, I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned, there's that word, for your welfare. Paul says, I have nobody like Timothy who's going to genuinely care for and take a genuine personal interest in your welfare church at Philippi. So again, we can understand that in a positive sense. It's good that Timothy is genuinely concerned for the church members. But then there's a second sense in which that word merimnao can be used. And in this sense, it means not just to be concerned, but to become overly concerned, to become apprehensive. And when the word is used in that sense, it's almost always translated as either anxiety or anxious or worry. And we see this multiple times throughout the New Testament. We've seen the passage in Philippians 4, but let me take you over to another passage that most of you will probably recognize. Go ahead and turn with me to Matthew 6, verses 25 through 34. Matthew 6, 25 through 34. There's a parallel passage for this one in Luke 12, 22 through 31, but for the sake of time, we can only cover so much. Okay, Matthew 6, here we go. I'm guessing that many of you will probably recognize this passage, but <laughs> I'm just going to read it. It's good for us to be reminded of it again. This is Jesus talking. Jesus says this, Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? As a side note, interestingly, this is true. You cannot add a single hour to your life by being anxious or excessively worried about things. But medical studies have shown you can certainly subtract some hours off your life if you have a lot of anxiety that's going on for a long period of time. But I digress. Let's keep going. Which of you... And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And then down in verse 34, Jesus summarizes his entire thought. And I love this verse. He says, therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will be anxious for itself. He's like, don't get overly worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. Let tomorrow worry or be anxious about itself. And he concludes, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. In other words, there's enough stuff going on right now without getting overly anxious about tomorrow when you don't even know what exactly is going to happen tomorrow. So, we got to look, note carefully what Jesus is saying here because we want to be subtle enough to understand it correctly. What he's communicating is this. He's not saying 
you should never wor- I'm sorry, you should never have any concern for these things. He's not communicating you should never in your life have concern for what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear. I mean, that's, that's just a part of life. You have to take care of those, those basic needs that are in front of you, both for yourself and for your family. What Jesus is getting at is he's saying, do not be overly concerned about them, which then turns into anxiety and worry. It's like there's this invisible line where we, where we can cross, where we can be concerned for something, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. And then we cross this line and we move into the secondary sense of the word that's being used here, where suddenly we're just getting too concerned about it. And we're spending too much energy and thought life thinking about it, particularly when it's something that we don't even have total control over. With that in mind, I want to spend a little bit of time just exploring what anxiety is. Because these are powerful passages and you hear them quoted all the time for good reason. Because so many people struggle with anxiety or excessive worry. So let's take a look at what anxiety is. Anxiety, it's an interesting emotion. It's its, its own kind of animal. For example, you might hear somebody say something like, yeah, you know, fear, anxiety, any of those negative emotions, we should avoid all of those. If, if it's a negative feeling, then it shouldn't be in our minds. But actually, that's not true. Let's use fear as an example. Fear is a perfect example because it's similar to anxiety. It's not particularly pleasant. It's something we try to avoid now, when it's happening, we don't enjoy it, but fear as an emotion is, although it can be unhealthy, it is also at times very healthy, uh, even necessary for us to feel. So I'll give a, an example from my own life. This was a few years ago, and this was when we were in seminary. I say we, I was in seminary, but Dana helped so much, it felt like we were in seminary. We were down in Dallas, and if, you don't, if you've ever been to Dallas Seminary, you know that it is right next to downtown Dallas. I mean, right in the middle of the city. And so being from Colorado, and Dana as well, we both wanted to get out of the city and spend some time in the mountains. So we planned this trip to Taos, New Mexico. And just in case you're wondering, if you want to get a, a condo in Taos during the off-season in the summer, it's really cheap. <laughs> you can find some great deals. So I found one of those deals, and we went up to Taos, and at this time, we only had two of our three kids. We had Thea, which, was, which she was around two years old at that time. And then Gussie was born a year and a half after Thea. So she was just a little baby. Anyway, we get to Taos, and it's beautiful. And one of the big things that we had planned to do while we were there is we wanted to hike up to this particular lake that we kept hearing about. It's one of those postcard lakes that you'll see where it's got, you know, the crystal clear, smooth surface and all the mountains surrounding it and the forest back behind it. So the day after we got there, we went up to the, to the trailhead and we got the kids all packed up. We used those, uh, I don't know what they're called, but basically backpacks where you just tote your kid around in them. Their legs hang down here. It's not very comfortable because the kid moves a lot, but you know, you got to carry them somehow. So we get the kids all situated. I'm carrying Thea. Dana's carrying Gussie. We have all our gear, picnic gear, things like that. And we hike on up to this lake. It's about three and a half miles up. It's been a great hike. We meet some other hikers on the way up, enjoy talking to them, and we get to the top, and it is just as beautiful as everybody said. I mean, just a gorgeous mountain lake. So we go off by ourselves a little ways, and we sit down. We get the kids all out of their packs, spread out their lunch. We're looking forward to just relaxing and enjoying the next hour staring at this lake and the mountains surrounding it. And I turn around to grab something and I hear Dana kind of make a <gasps> noise. And so I look up and I see at the tree line about 150 yards away, the absolute biggest bear I've ever seen in my entire life. Just rumbling out of the woods like he wants to come over and chat with us about the view or something. And I have seen some bears in my life, and I've run into plenty of bears from time to time in Colorado, but this, this guy was huge, way bigger than any bear I'd seen before. And let me tell you, fear kicked in, and it kicked in hard. And my body was absolutely flooded with adrenaline in that moment. 
I assume my brain went through an instant fight or flight back and forth decision, immediately decided on flight, which was the right thing to do. And I don't even totally know what happened over the next few minutes. The next thing I knew, I kind of woke up and I was almost pushing Dana ahead of me on the trail, like go, 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 go. And I had Thea under one arm and I had the packs under the other arm and we were trying not to run to attract the bear's attention, but moving very quickly back to where we had left the other hikers. And I was tired after that hike. I'd been carrying my little daughter and all the other gear for three and a half miles. But in that moment, she weighed nothing at all. I couldn't, I couldn't even feel the weight of the packs because I was so flooded with fear and therefore adrenaline to get my wife and my kids out of this dangerous situation. So fear, though unpleasant, is, depending on the situation, a really good thing. And I'm sure we could come up with all types of other examples. If you see a poisonous snake, you should feel fear. Why? Well, because it's dangerous. It could really hurt you. You need to get out of there. If you're in a precarious situation, then you're going to feel fear. Your brain is trying to signal you danger, danger. You need to get back to safety. And even the Bible itself acknowledges that though there are times where we shouldn't be afraid, especially excessively afraid, there are also appropriate situations for us to feel fear. I'll give you one example that demonstrates this really well. This is Matthew 10, 28, which says this, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. In other words, we shouldn't live in fear of man. Why? Because the worst that a person can do is take your life. But we should fear. We should have a high reverence, a very healthy respect for the being that has power not just over your physical life, but also over your eternal fate. So the Bible acknowledges that there are bad times to fear. There's plenty of verses that say, don't be afraid. And then it also acknowledges that there are good times to fear. But folks, listen to me on this. This isn't true of anxiety. Unless I completely missed it, nowhere does the Bible say that we should be anxious Nowhere does scripture encourage us to feel anxiety about a given set of circumstances. In scripture, anxiety isn't viewed as useful. It's not something that we are encouraged to make a part of our lives. Even though somewhat similar emotions like fear, we are, depending on the situation, scripturally encouraged to fear. Now, why is this the case? We need to ask why. We have to understand this, not just say it and move on. Why is this the case? Why is it that scripture doesn't encourage us to be anxious? I think the answer lies in this. Because anxiety results from worrying about circumstances that are beyond our ability to control. Let me say that again. Why are we not encouraged to be anxious? I think the answer is because anxiety results when we are worrying about circumstances that are actually completely beyond our ability to control them. Now, you might hear me say that and think, well, what's the difference between that and fear? That sounds almost the same. Well, I think the difference is this. Let's go back to the example of the bear. Fear results when you actually see the bear coming towards you. That elicits a fear response. Anxiety is when you can't even enjoy the hike in the first place because you're so concerned about the possibility of running into a bear. I'll repeat that. Fear results when you actually see the bear coming towards you. It's happening now. Anxiety is when you're too scared to go hiking or if you are hiking, you just can't enjoy a minute of it because you're petrified about the possibility of running into a bear. Let me give you another example, maybe a little better one, a biblical example. Look at the end of Matthew 34. We talked about this just a minute ago. 
I'm not going to reread the passage, but you remember what it says. Jesus says, look, don't be anxious. Don't worry. About what? Don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear or the span of your life. Don't worry about these things. But note carefully how Jesus concludes. Again, verse 34, he gives his summary thoughts. He says, in light of everything that I've just said, here's what you can conclude. And Jesus concludes it this way. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. Don't be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will be anxious for itself. In other words, what Jesus is communicating is stop worrying about these things that may or may not happen in the future. Today, your heavenly father has taken care of you. You have everything that you need. But this anxiety is resulting from being worried about whether or not you're going to have those things in the future. In the future, as every one of us knows, isn't something that we have control over. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know what the next month is going to hold. All I know is what's in front of my face. We try to be prepared. We try to be ready. But it's not worth being anxious about the future, which is something that I don't even have the ability to control. So Jesus summarizes it all. He says, these things that you're worried about, you're worried about them because you're thinking about the future. And stop worrying about that. The future can worry about itself. Rather, sufficient for this day, right now, in the present, is its own trouble. Maybe that doesn't cover every reason for anxiety, but I would encourage you, if you're struggling with anxiety and fear, I'm sorry, not fear, if you're struggling with anxiety and worry, to really think about that. What are the reasons that I feel so anxious? And I would guess that most, if not all, of the reasons for that anxiety is because you're worrying about circumstances that are beyond your control. Either they happened in the past and you can't do anything about that now, or they may happen in the future, or you're just thinking a bunch of what ifs this happens, what if whatever you're anxious about happens. So think about that. Anxiety results from worrying about circumstances that are beyond our ability to control. And when we start getting obsessed with things that are beyond our ability to control, it, it readily saps the joy out of our life because then we're catastrophizing things and we're making a situation worse than it actually is. Let's move on to the solution. We've talked about scripture's view of anxiety, how it's being communicated. It's not just being Uh, concerned or caring for something. There's a lot of things worth being concerned or caring for. It's being overly concerned. It's caring a little too much. And that turns into anxiety or worry when it's specifically about things that we really can't control anyways. But as I said at the beginning of the sermon, I, I, I really appreciate this about the Bible. It doesn't just leave us with a bunch, a bunch of do's and don'ts. It gives us a, a way to remove anxiety from our minds, saying, do this instead, and instead of anxious thoughts, you're going to experience peace. So where do we see this? Where's the solution to all this? Where's the biblical prescription for overcoming anxiety? Turn with me back to the book of Philippians. We're going to talk about the passage And then I'm going to end with, as I said, some very practical ways to put this into use. And then we'll wrap it up. Philippians chapter 4. Here we go. All right. I'm going to read the passage one more time because it's not long. And I'll take it down through the end, through verse, uh, I'll take it down through verse 9. Paul says this, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. That's solution number one, but keep reading. That's not all of it. 
And verse 7, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Where do we find our solution in those verses? Well, it starts up with verse 6. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Now, you might hear that and say, yes, I know, I have been praying about it. And listen, I'm not, I'm not in your mind. I don't know. I can't hear your prayers. And perhaps you have been. But let me just encourage you, as one of your pastors, something I run into all the time with Christians, and, and again, even in my own life, is that when we pray, we talk to God more like he's our boss than our father. It's like we're very, very careful how we state our concerns. We're always carefully watching our words. Now, I'm not advocating that you be disrespectful to God, that you start accusing him of things that you know are not true. But for goodness sakes, look at the Psalms. The psalmists, those guys, they pour their heart out to God. I mean, they lay it out there. They're not trying to be pretty with their language. They're not trying to hold anything back. They're giving honest statements like, Lord, I feel like you've forsaken me. I know that you're always faithful and true, but I feel alone. And if I encourage you to pray that way, to tell God, Lord, I'm anxious and I can't seem to do anything about it. And I'm worried about things I can't even control. I need your help. And I feel like I can't stop. Help me. When you pray, you got to do it honestly, like you're talking to a father who loves you, who wants nothing more than for you to come to him and explain in detail how you're feeling. But note too what Paul says. He says, do this with thanksgiving. Why? Because it's within thanksgiving that we're continually reminded of the faithfulness of God. And again, you look at the Psalms and so many of them end on that note reminding of the times that God has been faithful and reassuring that God is going to continue to be faithful in the future. But Christian, you've got to be honest in your prayers. You've got to lay it out for him. And you don't have to try to be clean in the way that you do it. Let him know how you're genuinely feeling. But within that, you're remembering all the times in the past that he's been faithful. We'll talk about that more in just a minute. Keep going down to verse 8. What else? Paul concludes, he says, uh, verse 6, Don't be anxious, but in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then verse 7, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, it's not something you'll even fully understand, but you're going to have it, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Then he hits verse 8, and this is so incredibly important and overlooked in the average evangelical Christian's life. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And then he concludes in verse 9 with the same promises in verse 7. Practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Christian, you have to stop being reactive with what you allow into your mind and start being proactive about that. You have to guard what you allowed into your mind with, with an iron gate and very high standards. I, I'm amazed how many people Christians who love the Lord, who I've talked to over the years, who will say something like, man, I just, I'm really struggling with my prayer life. I'm struggling with my thought life. I feel like I can't really commune with God very well. 
And I asked them, what are you doing with your free time? And the answer is, I'm watching television all the time. I'm watching my Netflix shows. And listen, before you accuse me of being a curmudgeon, I'm not saying that all TV is bad. I'm not saying that every single show out there is bad. I'm just saying that a lot of them are just junk. It's like we somehow don't see this connection between what we allow into our minds and we think it's not going to affect our spiritual walk with God, that it's not going to affect how we go about our days. You gotta be so careful of what you allow into your mind and not allow media and advertising and Facebook and whatever else to dictate what you are thinking about. So a really practical suggestion. Number one, stop watching the news all the time. Newscasters, what do they do? They catastrophize. Not every time, but a lot of times because it gets more views. They focus on all the negative things because that's what people watch. So what can you choose to do? I can't change what CNN or Fox or NBC chooses to air, but I can choose whether or not I allow it to fill my brain. So practical suggestion, maybe you need to stop watching the news so much or at least seriously cut down on the kind of news that you watch. And I've heard a lot of people saying they're doing just that, which is great. Number two is this, turn off the electronics. Just turn them off. Why? Because they overstimulate your mind. I realize that within our lives today, electronics are just a necessary part. Almost everybody's going to have to use them in one form or another. But in your free time, you can choose whether you overstimulate your mind with those. Study after study after study is coming out, and they're all saying the same thing. That excessive use of electronics especially social media, which is intended to grab and hold your attention. It literally ruins your ability to focus for long periods of time. It, it ruins your ability to just be calm and rest and have some silence because we get completely addicted to needing to have a little exciting check on Facebook to see what's changed, a little dopamine injection into our brains. So give it a rest. You know, turn them off. Go for a walk. Enjoy the sun on your back. Listen to the birds. And for goodness sakes, don't take your phone with you. <laughs> Here's another one. I want, I want to free you from this idea that everything that meets Paul's definition of being true and honorable and just and pure and lovely and commendable and excellent somehow as evangelical Christians, we think that the only things that are going to meet that definition are found in a Christian bookstore. And let me just free you from that. There are so many good things, even outside of scripture, that are worth putting in your mind. There's so many good autobiographies where you get to learn about somebody's life and see the mistakes and the triumphs that he or she had. And that is useful to think about. There's so many novels. There's a lot of bad novels and there's a lot of good novels too. There's so many good books out there that are worth reading and thinking about. At our house, Dana just had the girls. We went through the whole Chronicle of Narnia series. We did the Little Women series. We did the, um, oh, Secret Garden. Thea loved that one. We did the whole Lord of the Rings series. Sometimes we read out loud. Sometimes we just play them because you can just listen to them. Um, there's so many apps or different companies that you can listen to the book being read to you. There are a lot of things in this world, and even the commentaries agree, that this isn't referring to exclusively Christian material that are worth thinking about. There's a lot of great self-help books out there. I'm reading a really good one right now. It's not so much self-help. It's more just how to work smarter. It's called Deep Work by Cal Newport. And I have been learning a ton from that book, learning ways to improve my own work day and focus my attention. And then, of course, Scripture also meets that definition. Obviously, spend time in Scripture, allow it to fill your mind, memorize some of it. But you're not going to spend every waking hour reading Scripture. Even outside of that, find things that are true and commendable and just and excellent. And he concludes, and the peace of God will be with you. It's like you make room for peace instead of just constant noise and stimuli. 
Let me wrap it up. Again, this is a very practical sermon. I think it's practical because the Bible is practical. Paul is saying many things meet this definition. Choose to fill your mind with good things instead of things that the world is telling you should be filling your mind with. Be very particular. Be proactive, not reactive, about what you allow into your thoughts. One other resource we're going to give you is after this, we will release, after this sermon is released, we'll, enter, we'll release another section of the interview I did with Dr. Jim Johnson. We're going to be talking specifically about anxiety. I hope that that's useful to you and that during the next week, you are careful with what you allow to go, to rattle around in your brain. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that it is practical, that it is applicable. I thank you, Father, that through Paul's words, we can learn to be very careful and decisive about what we allow to go into our brains. Lord, help us to not feel like we have to constantly consume media or the news or social media, any of those things. But instead, we can choose what we want to go in and what we're going to leave out. Lord, I pray you'd be with us this week, especially those of us who are, I think all of us probably are on some level, dealing with anxiety or worry. Help us to remind ourselves of your faithfulness to remind ourselves of the times you've taken care of us in the past so that rather than worry about the future, we can trust you to take care of us then as well. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Seth, for that encouragement. I love what he said there when he said, uh, focus your mind on these things, on the things of God. And this next song, Behold Our God, does just that. It focuses us on who God is and how powerful and awesome he is. Let's sing this together. Who has held the oceans in his hands? Who has numbered every grain of sand? Kings and nations tremble his voice. All creation rises to rejoice. Behold our God, seated on his throne. Come, let us adore.
joining us for this time of worship. Remember, if you have any questions or would like to get in touch with us, you can visit us on our website at cbcomaha.org. Have a great week.